It was the 2nd of August, 2018 when Apple achieved a historic milestone as the world's first publicly valued company to surpass a mind-boggling $1 trillion mark. But that staggering number barely scratches the surface of Apple's influence. Imagine being the creator of the very first thing that millions upon millions of individuals gaze at each morning upon awakening. Welcome to the Biz Brew, subscribe and let's dive in. This is Apple's domain. Their intricate supply chain can source minuscule amounts of rare earth minerals from the heart of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, integrate them into some of the world's most cutting-edge computers, and transport the entire masterpiece to the vast plains of Mongolia. Remarkably, Apple's ascent boils down to three pivotal interfaces, the Macintosh OS, the iPod click wheel, and the revolutionary iPhone touchscreen. Everything else in the tech realm has been a ferocious battle over how the pie would be divvied up among rivals and imitators. In the realm of user-friendly interfaces, empires are born and thrive. IBM reigned as an empire with its punch card mainframes until the 1970s. Then came the graphical user interface, propelling both Apple and Microsoft from niche players to colossal Goliaths. Microsoft, joining the Trillion Dollar Club in April 2019, followed closely behind Amazon. Apple, on the other hand, teetered on the brink of collapse in the late 1990s, until the ingenious iPod click wheel emerged as a savior, making browsing through endless lists a delightful experience. BlackBerry's empire crumbled when the iPhone's touchscreen took center stage. Even Amazon's empire sprouted from an interface concept, one-click shopping. The value of this patent alone is staggering. Amazon raked in billions by licensing it to Apple for the launch of the iTunes Store. However, its impact on Amazon has been even more monumental. By eliminating cumbersome checkout steps, one-click shopping gave Amazon a decisive edge over the notorious cart abandonment challenge. This innovation transformed impulsive online shopping into a reality, boosting Amazon sales by an astonishing 5%, a remarkable achievement considering the slim profit margins in their industry. Furthermore, it incentivized customers to remain logged into Amazon, enabling the silent construction of user profiles and propelling Amazon into a platform that sells and recommends anything under the sun, transcending its initial book-focused origins. While Amazon's one-click button holds tremendous significance, it yields the spotlight only to the Facebook-like button in terms of sheer influence. Apple's revolutionary innovations, the graphical user interface GUI, and the touchscreen, share a profound connection rooted in metaphor. The Macintosh OS embraced user-friendliness by borrowing intuitive physics from our understanding of the physical world, using the desktop metaphor as a bridge. The touchscreen, in turn, replaced the mouse cursor with direct touch input, fulfilling the promise of more seamless interaction. Surprisingly, the iPhone's logic evolved from the desktop computer, evident in tapping apps to open them, dragging them on the home screen, and the concept of versatile applications themselves. The desktop metaphor's subtle influence remains ingrained in our digital experiences, guiding us effortlessly without conscious thought. Metaphors play a fascinating role in our understanding of technology, guiding us as we embrace new innovations. They help us climb a ladder of comprehension, with each rung building upon the previous one. However, as technology evolves, metaphors eventually break down, leading to frustrations. Apple's skeuomorphic designs serve as an example. Initially useful, they mimicked physical objects for familiarity. We no longer require a digital calendar to resemble a leather-bound book or digital shelves to buy ebooks. The breakdown of metaphors reminds us that technology's magic can transform into an unwieldy burden when metaphors overstay their welcome. The design community's aversion to skeuomorphism is traced back to the Bauhaus movement, which rejected decorative elements that bridged the gap between the old and new worlds. This philosophy was embodied in Marcel Brewer's innovative metal-framed club chairs, which showcased the unique capabilities of steel through chrome plating. In the realm of computers, the fidelity to real-world representations that once made interfaces user-friendly had devolved into a form of deception. Should pixels mimic metal and wood if they were not truly made of those materials? When Johnny Ive, an industrial designer known for his material-focused approach, assumed control of software design at Apple, he introduced a new, clean language for the iPhone's operating system in 2013. This shift was hailed as a triumph of Ive's refined taste over the preferences of others, like Scott Forstall, who had overseen iOS development. However, what truly transpired was the realization that Apple's founding metaphors, once essential for easing the transition to the digital world, had become irrelevant. 
The need for the iPhone's calendar to resemble a physical desk calendar diminished as people abandoned their physical counterparts in favor of the iPhone itself. The golden rule of metaphor in design is to fake it till you make it. Apple had made it, having relied on metaphors until the point of achieving widespread acceptance and familiarity. The world of digital interfaces is not merely a matter of convenience, it has profound implications for both the companies creating these metaphors and the people living with them. As Apple's visual and underlying metaphors began to age, our digital lives grew increasingly perplexing. The App Store, initially uncertain of its potential, rapidly transformed into a juggernaut, giving rise to the app economy and the era of mobile computing. Yet, rarely do we question why the App Store resonated with users and how its initial assumptions shaped subsequent developments. The answer lies in an underlying metaphor. In the late 19th century, stores operated differently. Products were kept behind counters or glass, and shoppers had to rely on shopkeepers to retrieve them. However, visionaries like Harry Gordon Selfridge changed the game, introducing self-service concepts where goods were displayed openly on shelves, enticing shoppers to make their own choices. Fast forward to the present, and this remains the standard in stores worldwide. The Apple Store, when it opened in 2001, followed this model, with software boxed on shelves. So when the App Store emerged, mirroring the open shelves of physical stores, it reinforced the idea that apps were discrete entities, akin to standalone goods like Microsoft Word, used for specific purposes. However, as the app economy flourished, this assumption began to crack. Simple tasks, like arranging a dinner date with friends, turned into convoluted sequences of texting, searching for restaurants, checking calendars, and making reservations. The technology that once promised ease now seemed to dictate our actions. The root cause of these frustrations lies in the flawed metaphor that birthed the app economy. While apps are consumed through the store metaphor, they are underpinned by the interconnected nature of the internet. We navigate apps as if they are isolated entities, rather than recognizing their web of interconnections. These conflicting paradigms barely align with the true purpose of our smartphones, keeping what and who we care about within reach. The burden of piecing together fragmented experiences falls on us, the users. Resolving this requires a new metaphor that redefines how smartphones function. Imagine a smartphone that centers around the relationships we value. Instead of opening apps to connect with loved ones, we would effortlessly remain connected, with tools appearing organically when needed, within the flow of our relationships. Envision a metaphor of human connection, where smartphones become facilitators of closeness rather than mere programs. Thank you for watching, follow for more.